Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Coolman here, and I have another episode, Drafting to Win, where I play Limited, this time in Ikoria, which the set just released um, two days ago, and I've been doing a bunch of runs, and they've been going some well, some I'm doing some experimentation, but um, it's it's fun to just test out the, the new cards. This set seems really powerful. Um, there's a lot of swings back and forth. Mutate is a crazy mechanic, and the cycling lets you fix a, a lot in this set. So what I love about it is the mutate is going to take some, that whole mechanic, it's going to take some time to get used to. When should you mutate versus when should you just play the creature on its own? And planning around the types of removal that's in this format. Um, black has the best removal. It has the most forms of removal at common rarity so drafting black is not a bad direction to go into um, the new direction that drafting is going to take is human drafting online and i love this method versus doing bot draft bot draft you can get weird things if you guys remember back to um, guilds of ravnica you could draft the the gates deck where you get a gate colossus and a bunch of uh, like Simic Guild Gate and all the other colors that you could make five color decks. Um, as long as you had that one creature that, depending on how many gates you had, it dealt damage to the opponent. Or the goat, it was like a goat card, was a green card with vigilance that would get plus one, plus one, or whatever, with depending on how many gates you have. You make this into a huge creature and just tack for the win. Um, bots. The reason that was so easy to get is because bots didn't value that deck very highly, so you could draft it very easily, and so you can get lots of wins that way. That cannot happen, nothing like that, with human drafting. Human drafting is better because you, people know the meta. They know if they should go for black-white humans or <clears throat> big, big green, blue-green monsters with mutate or whatever it is, um, or like... Azorius Flyers. Like, people are drafting this, and they're going to be blocking you from getting all the cards you want. And they might even take a color out of outside of their set so that nobody else has it. And it's no, there's nothing offered in the set that you would make your deck better. And so part of the strategy is, I'm going to take it away from someone else. It's very legitimate. So uh, I've got a Mardu run. I almost got there. I went 6-3. and three, And I'm going to go through the drafting. Um, let's, let's get started with it. But by the way... This episode is going to be how to approach a new format when you don't know all the mechanics. I mean, you should know what the mechanics are um, in the basic forms, but if you don't know how they interact and you're doing some experimentation. So you're going to see some picks that if you're watching this video in the in the future, um, it's April 18, 2020. If you're watching this a couple weeks or months down the road, you're still going to get value from this video with your next set that comes out and how we approach it. So that's the point of this, because I want to make all this content last for uh, months or years after all these sets go away. We're talking about the fundamentals of drafting and how you should approach a new set. Just so happens to be at Coria. Um, let's get going, let's see the picks, and I'm gonna talk through my mentality. So much better. So I streamed this game, um, and you're gonna see if I, behind, me right now because i'm overlaying the webcam is me streaming underneath and i had music playing and stuff so i gotta go no sound but we're gonna provide some commentary over the top of it and let's get started okay so loading up the draft we see ruminous ultimatum it's like the first card so i decided to go with that one um i went into this pretty blind like I don't even know all the cards in this set. I'm just sort of analyzing it and seeing what's offered to me. And I'm trying to choose the best cards in the beginning of the draft and then work around them in picks three, four, and onward. I think it's fun in, in a new set to try to um, see what the archetypes are. Here, I thought about getting General's Enforcer, but I went with Blood Curdle instead, which is removal. It's like one of the best removals. It's instant speed, four mana. 
After that, I got my eyes on the Void Beckner, which is just a solid big card that you could cycle away. If you cycle it away, it puts Death Touch on a target creature you control. I ended up going with that pick, Void Beckner. Here, Zagath Mamba is pretty easy. I don't know that I'm going to be choosing a lot of mutate creatures in Mardu colors. I'm not even sure if I'm going to go Mardu yet, but um, I know it was my pack one pick one, but I'm not super attached to it. I've been really liking um, black in this set and then white. White has lots of like humans and lots of flyers, and they work really well together. My first deck that I ever drafted in this format was um, Black White Humans, and that that run went pretty pretty good. I think it went like four wins, three losses, and the three losses were um, they were whatever. But so I went with Zagoth Mamba, thinking that I could be prioritizing some mutate creatures. Um, having that one three flyer, it's. It doesn't see. It didn't do that well for me. I didn't think this card was that great. I know it's an uncommon one-three flyer that's hard to remove, because if you deal um, non-combat damage, it doesn't actually kill it. But it doesn't. It's not that impactful either, right? Um, the good part is that it you can put a mutate on that creature on having that one-three flyer. Okay, I chose with go for blood, and it's too bad the camera's blocking it. I, I can't do anything about that. Um, I can't edit it on here because you'll see my streaming face anyway. So I'm, I'm doing some experimentation with these videos. I want to make sure that I bring like the best value to anybody who's watching this. Um, but, I mean, the series is called Drafting to Win because we're trying to showcase the decision-making so that you guys can see I, w I agree with that or I disagree with that line of play and maybe you get to learn so that's always the point of this series here I was really conflicted whether I should choose the 1-4 Vigilance Cat versus having Deadweight the reason I like the Serval and was considering it because this is a 2 drop with a big uh, body like a lot of toughness and you can always put mutate creatures on on it and having a mutate with vigilant vigilance is pretty good but i went with dead weight i'm not even sure if i ended up playing dead weight um, which i don't find a super impactful piece of removal in this format so far I, I think my my thoughts might change on that but we'll see as the format develops this is the fun part really about drafting new sets is that you're not sure what works but nobody else does either Went with Unlikely Aid. Wasn't a great pick or a great choice. A three mana combat trick. It, that, that card seemed expensive. Spontaneous Flight. I picked up Snare Tactician a few picks earlier. Snare Tactician is really good. Um, if you're playing like... You get a lot of benefit for cycling a card away. You get to tap their creature down or prevent them from attacking the next turn. And you still get the, the cycling benefit anyway. So Here I did not go with the Perimeter Sergeant. I believe I went with the Bloodfell Canvas. Uh, Bloodfell Caves, sorry. Um, so I can just fix because it looks like I'm pretty solidly going into Mardu. I decided to try out going to Ozolith. I didn't find it that great. I'm going to be more hesitant to picking it in the future, especially a pack two pick one here where there might be other options. Like, let's let, let's give this a pause. Cloud Piercer, Snare Tactician. Hopefully you guys can read that, but that's a Snare Tactician. Flame Spill, which deals four damage to target creature. Now it's three mana, so it's not it's not that great of removal. Momentum Rubbler, Cunning Night Bonder. Like, these are all the considerations. The Tiger, the 3-4 Flyer, 
Cavern Whisperer, maybe. So those those are the other picks I would have over Ozolith. If I could pick now, you'll see how how this works out for me, and it it, it does provide me some value, but not not a ton. This is going to be good and constructed when you can go do uh, like plus one plus one counters on here. Or I was thinking for like historic purposes, like minus one minus one counters to put on the Ozolus so that you can uh, put them on the opponent's creatures. Um, but in this format, where you're getting like menace counters, flying counters, first first strike counters, it didn't seem worth a card to hold on to those and then put them on a creature because. You have to play this card at the right time. Then you have to have your creatures with those counters on them die. And then you have to have another good target to put those counters on the next turn. That's how you get the Ozolith gets value. It's hard to set up even if you plan for it. So I, I, I would not pick this again. In this pack, I would probably go with Snare Tactician or Cloud Piercer. The way this deck is going to turn out, even Corpse Churn is better than that. Maybe the Tiger. So Snare Tactician or the Tiger with probably leaning on the Tiger. Knowing what I know now, I don't think I would choose Cunning Nightbonder. It'd be too black and too black for a 2-2. Two -two. And I didn't have any other flash creatures. So, yeah. I did end up choosing it. So fight is one versus divine arrow. I wasn't going to get bastion of remembrance here. So yeah, I do end up going with divine arrow. Um, here, easy prey seemed interesting. I know it only is destroying CMC two or less, but you know you, the fact that you could cycle it away uh, makes it a very like optional card. Blitz Leech is a little bit like bigger, six mana, but it seems like a really good set of value. Like Blitz Blitz Leech is a good card, and I would have gotten that second pick. <clears throat> Here, Perimeter Sergeant seems good, even though I don't have other humans. But I was considering just if I'm going to have a 3 mana, 3-2, three maybe the Wolverine gets me more upside. Oh, somewhere in there I did get a pacifism. I'm skipping over some of the boring picks that weren't too interesting. Frill Skill Mentor seemed interesting because I don't have tons of humans, even though I'm going in black-white colors. And that's really good if you have lots of non-humans. Sanctuary Smasher, and I really considered the Windscarred Crag so I could have Fixing. But that, that card seemed better than the, the good from Fixing stuff. Grabbing another Snare Tactician over having removal, because Rumbling Rock Slide is pretty decent removal. Almost always can kill a creature. I might have actually gone with that. Yeah, so I actually went with the with the removal. Okay, Cloud Piercer. Yeah, I think that's a pretty easy pick here. I don't think I'm gonna play any of these cards. Forbidden Friendship. Two mana, make one, 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 one of a human and a non-human. That's interesting. I that, That'll that definitely work in some decks, but not this one. I went with Sleeper Dart because it replaces itself. I don't think I ended up playing it. 
suffocating fumes i so far i don't think is good in this format not a whole lot of one power toughness creatures or sorry one one toughness creatures Perimeter Sergeant seems more of the deck, what this deck is trying to do. I thought this was going to be an aggressive deck. As it turns out, most other decks I went over top of in this run. Okay, Luminous Broodmoth. This card is really good. This is a, a high value limited card. You're almost always going to want to choose the, the Broodmoth. Over every, anything else in that pack. Heartless Act is almost like a cast down, if you guys remember that card. So I went with it. I wanted to stay away from. I wanted to stay away from um, non because I'm, I'm I'm going three colors in this draft, and so. I I will pick up some um like fixing for this deck but not not for like non-fixing non-color mana even if it does something good moloch over dead weight yep dusk bay mentor does not seem that good versus the blitz leech blitz leech is the pick here Maybe rumbling rock slide four mana removal at sorcery speed. I think I like the fixing more than I liked any of these cards. When you get later on in the draft, it's it's fine to because if you already think you have your cards that you're gonna play, if nothing on here is like obviously better than any of your current picks, it's always worth it to get mana that helps you fix and make your already good cards more consistent. This deck is not a weaponize the monsters deck. It's also not a healer deck. I think I went with dead weight and having two of them I didn't want to do Dark Bargain. So I ended up choosing the second dead weight. Now it makes I have in this deck I have two. I don't think I ended up playing two. So we're getting to the end of the draft where I I pretty much have the solid or like the, the most of the cards in my deck that I actually want to play. I go through and I take out all the cards I'm not going to be playing. You know, Zenith Flare looks interesting. I had six, five or six cyclers at this point. And so Zenith Flare does damage equal to the amount of cyclers in your graveyard. It can be good. It won't make it into this deck. But I was seriously considering it. Versus having the tiger here. I, I wanted to get the tiger, but I didn't click it in time. So the Zenith Flare is what I ended up with. It was kind of nice to get the Saval Crystal because it's in all the colors that I'm playing. So that's a good way to fix, and it's too cycling. So you can always get it away if you're, you know, have all the mana you need. Cycling is really good. Every card that has cycling printed on it is so much better if you can easily get rid of it. It is such a strong mechanic. It gives you so many options in limited. Okay, we're getting to the end of this. 
And I think the last one's land. So. Here I spend a, a few minutes. I just spend a lot of time taking stuff out, putting it in, seeing if my curve works. If this is interesting to you, let me know in comments and I can I can put it in future videos, but I'm going to skip through this part and just give you the final at the end. We are skipping through. And also, if you guys ever want to uh, check out the live stream on Coolman MTG, I can post a link below. Um, you could see this happen in real time and see why I'm thinking and how I'm thinking about it. But I don't think it's appropriate for this video. So we have the Ozlith. We have enough two drops. Looks like my two drops are almost all removal. You can see here Divine Arrow, Pacifism, Easy Prey, Heartless Act. My three drops are a lot of pretty strong creatures, you know, relatively for the three drop slot. I'm pretty evenly spread out on all the colors, which is okay, because I think I have enough fixing that I can get to all three colors, and I really didn't have mana problems throughout this run. And I've got some top end, and of course Ruinous Ultimatum to get us to the final. So that's the deck in the nutshell. Let's start, let's start with the games. Okay. Game one. I kept this hand because I know I have cycling with the Sanctuary Smasher. And so if I drew any land for that third land, I'd be able to cycle and, and fix myself into playables. I got sort of like the opponent opponent did not play anything. Cycle away, really hope for that white source. I was lucky I found it. Here I think I you go with the perimeter sergeant so that you can have just a three three power attacker on the board. And it's, if he wants to use removal or or counter this or something with his open mana, I don't mind. I'd rather have the Snare Tactician for development later on. And also having the Perimeter Sergeant on the field, with the, if I were to play the Snare Tactician this turn... They would the snare tactician would be activated by having um, the extra plus one attack because the snare tactician is a human. Something to consider, and something I'd probably thought about. Okay, I was happy about finding my second white source, so I can get the brood moth out. So as I'm thinking about it, instead of just dropping the Spell Eater Wolverine, which would have been a 3-2 body that w didn't have double tr double strike yet because I don't have the instants and sorceries, I went with the Snare Tactician uh, because maybe if I draw a Cycler, like the Voidbeckner right now, if I cycle that away, I can tap down his creature and get in for extra damage. I went with this play so I could just go for, for more damage. And then I can drop the Spell we spell Eater Wolverine. As I'm looking at it now, though, maybe just doing the Broodmoth pass might have been better. I don't think I realized the, the significance of how good Broodmoth was. 
there's a possibility for counter magic. You really don't want Broodmoth to, to be countered. I decided to go to attacks before I play the, the three mana card. And here, you want to go with the Raptor. It's better to just play out the 4-2 with no text than the 3-2 that... If this one gets countered, that's fine with me. So you see how playing suboptimally when it's appropriate might be better for... Yep, right there. You're playing into the counter. I don't know why the screen, screen went dark. Um, it might happen a couple times. I'm just streaming. I'm changing changing settings and stuff. Okay, I I know he's getting cards, he's getting value every time he attacks and he hits me in the face. But I think that's all right because I have him low, like relatively speaking, like 10 health. And so I think I can go over the top of him. So I'm kind of identifying that I'm the aggressive player and I'm trying to get underneath him. And if he outvalues me by getting more card advantage than taking over the board, that's the way that his win condition is going to go. Okay, kind of sour that I that I got that uh, that really good card like countered, but I still can go over the top. If he wants to double block me, I think that's okay because I'm taking out two of his cards, and I get that extra like the snare tactician gets one point of extra damage. I I thought that was important. All this is sort of sort of setting up so that I get that ruinous ultimatum and he got the win you know the fact that he's attacking here i know he wants to get extra life but opponents making a decision here that they're looking for something they know their deck better than than i do obviously but they're looking for something that can remove my flyers but opponents should definitely consider just leaving their three five back so that with reach, well, I don't know if it has reach. Is that, I don't know, is that what that means? I should know. And and block my, uh, my damage from coming through because that's the way I'm going to win this game. I'm setting myself up, obviously, for that ruinous ultimatum. If I get that, I feel like I have the win. Okay, got captured, feared. This could be anyone's game at this point. I feel like I'm ahead. But I have so much life to work with here. We'll let our opponent outvalue us. Because if I draw that one land, if I draw a white source, I've got it. Well, actually, not even. If I have the white source, I don't quite have the win yet, but I definitely feel better. Okay. Just having a mutate creature, I think this is actually the win right here. Opponent could have something to interact with my creature. If they have blue mana up, they could be countering it. They've already countered one big thing but you know play play to your win right so let's force my opponent to have something to stop this from occurring so let's go for lethal put the mutate on the flyer swing it in And just reading my opponent here, if they have nothing to interact with this, with my board state, it's a mistake on them to keep on attacking. Even though they're gaining value, they're getting, they're drawing cards, 
they got to be on defense because they're they should be outvaluing me. But I found the win. Um, yeah, so the opponent played a little bit too risky when there was no need for them to play risky. You know. All right, let's go into game number two. Kept a hand with three lands. Happy about that, and at least two playables. This sets us up so that we can start off uh, strong enough. Obviously looking for the black source. But if we don't get it, it's not the end of the world. Like, if we don't get it soon. I was happy to draw another three drop. Okay, and then something to cycle away. So here, what what should you play? Um, I was considering Snare Tactician because I could be cycling next turn. Just a possibility for it. But at this point, you know, there was an argument to be made about just playing out the Perimeter Sergeant. And get that extra attack in. Or that extra, like, point of, of damage. Here, I don't think it matters too much. Just just got to lay something down. Now, I did see that the opponent... Oh, see, that's actually why I did it. I played the Snare Tactician as a 2-3 body. So in case he mutates the Mamba, it doesn't kill off my Snare Tactician. Whereas it, he would get free value to kill off my Perimeter Sergeant because he has 2 toughness. That's kind of just a testing attack. See what the opponent might do. Then on this turn, it was whether I was going to play the Stormwild Capador versus the Frenzied Raptor. And of course, I decided on the 1-3 Flyer. It's just not going to die in case he mutates. You don't want to give your opponents free targets to make their cards valuable. It's better to not play your cards. Don't play into your opponent's strategy if they're clearly presenting what it is. Let's see if I do it. Yeah, so that might potentially be a mistake. It might have been better here. If if I turn it back and my opponent mutates, then that was a mistake because I'm just giving them free value to kill off my 3-2. So if I could redo this game, knowing, like, just thinking through it right now, I think what I should do is just counter or um, cycle away the Sanctuary Smasher. Now, for whatever reason, I was I got lucky, I guess, because opponent did not have a mutate card to put on to kill off my my three two. The reason I decided to go for this attack is because I that perimeter sergeant feels very vulnerable and I don't mind trading with his creatures now I probably should knowing what I know a little bit more now recording this video after doing a couple runs that I didn't consider at the time of doing this run is that that's probably what his deck wants to do playing green playing black they want lots of graveyard synergies so the fact that I'm trading with him he's happy about that so this is probably a good thing for my opponent now I was able to have like a combat trick with cycling that away, tapping down the creature, putting push, first strike on my guy. So I didn't lose anything out of it. Opponent might be just kind of mana screwed here. They're not playing, th they're, they're setting up their deck, but they're not playing anything fast enough. This seems like a pretty good attack. And I have black up with the back up with the blitz leech. Which I think is a really good card. As of right now.
I feel I always feel real comfortable. Okay, this is. I feel real comfortable at this point when I'm slowly hitting down my opponent and they're developing, but they're not doing anything amazing. Um, yeah, so they just conceded. I felt that was a good target to kill off, even though I know the mutate comes in because I don't want the activated ability to do minus two, minus two, and he removes my, my three, two creature. So that's why I thought it was still worth a card to do that. Nice win. Let's go to game three. Okay, kept a hand with two lands, as you guys can see, and Divine Arrow. Felt that was safe enough, and also Easy Prey that I could cycle away. Cycling is so important. It just makes it so that you can be more risky with your picks and with your keepable hands. I really like the, the cycle mechanic in this set and i don't mind that my opponent has it because you play in such a way that you trust your decisions better and you're developing your decisions so if i get options and my opponent gets options i want to make better decisions than my opponent that's that's where we get our wins i think it was fine to remove that there because that card can get bigger and, and scarier that two three And then here, the fact that I have removal, you know, I could cycle mine away, but I'd, I'd rather just go one for one with my opponent. I have a lot more cards than they do, so if I hit my land drop, I can do a lot of things. And I still have Divine Arrow in case I don't hit my land drop. I'm not, like, down and out from this game. Don't hit the land drop, but I still feel all right. Because I know it's coming soon, just by the mechanics of the deck. Like, statistically, I'm likely to get it. Now, it, I've, I've missed three times in a row not getting that third land drop. But you design the deck so that you, it can still work with all the variants that is just a normal part of magic. Don't get pissed at the deck. Don't get, like, upset. Like, you made the deck. You should plan for in case you don't get the right amount of land drops. Like, you don't overdo it. Like, you don't do lots of fours, fives, six drops. What if you get land screwed? That's why you have to get those one, two, three, four drops. And if our opponent hadn't gone aggressive, and they were more aggressive in this game, if they had gone even more aggressive, the, with the Divine Arrow, with the backup that I have, that that's what's protecting us from the early game. Because we don't know what we're going to face. That's why we make the decisions that we do. Okay, finally found it. What are we going to do here? I know he has first strike. Two toughness creature. Or sorry, two power creature. That thing always... I'm always scared of that thing. That thing could get big very easily because there's lots of cycling. Especially in the is it colors. Where the deck is... I mean, there's so many cycling cards in is it. And also I've been hearing that Boros is a good like cycling deck. So, here my plan is just to divine arrow in a way. I don't even want to play something on the field because that thing wouldn't be able to block. And my opponent's not presenting like they're they're throwing down tons and tons of creatures. So here they're they're cycling, which gets them value, but it actually does nothing for them, because I'm just gonna be throwing the divine arrow anyway. So you see how we're kind of playing, I don't want to say like sub-optimally, but we're, we're not just giving our opponent stuff where they can gain advantages on us. I'm at a healthy life total. I have a lot more cards than my opponent. Even the Divine Arrow getting countered, I'm not too upset about it because that's kind of a throwaway card for me. And I don't feel horrible about my, about my like life total and the aggression that my opponent is 
like giving us on, on, the, on the board. I can recover from here. I know I have removal. If I keep doing this, I have a lot more cards in my hand that will outvalue my opponent. It's also worth noting that my, I've known my opponent has five mana up, uh, six mana, and they haven't played any, any huge drops yet, so they probably don't have it in their hand. If they play a, a big creature, like a six drop creature, it means they just drew it. Okay, I'm aware that this could be counter magic. They've already displayed that they've played counter magic, so I'm probably just going to throw out a whatever creature here. Maybe Snare Tactician or the Storm Wild Capridor. Okay. Throw out the Snare, snare Tactician. It's a good enough target. Will they counter it? And I'm fine if they do. Okay. They had removal. That's fine by me. That's much better than if I had thrown out the Wolverine and they remove that. So let's do the same thing. This is a good play because the Snare Tactician can block what's on the field and it's not even my best card in my hand. If my, play, if my opponent's not going to play anything, I'll slow play this and outvalue them. So I love seeing that. The fact that my opponent used two pieces of removal that they drew off the top of the deck, and I still have my best cards in hand, that's why I, I made the plays I did. So even then, when I have life 10 life total, I'm not scared of getting like Zerg down and losing next turn. Starting to play slightly better cards. Like, the Wolverine is a better card than the Capridor, and I'm comfortable playing that. It also can block everything on the field. And, like, my opponent has to have a huge swingy card like my Ruminous Ultimatum, some equivalent of that to get back into this game. And if they have it, they have it, but I also have my own, so something to consider. Here, I'm not scared of counter magic. If if they have it, that's like they've been holding on to it forever. And if I get this thing down, then my board state is very difficult for my opponent to deal with. No need to attack here. I'm pl The longer this game goes on, the more likelihood I have to win. My opponent's like, already played out everything they're going to do and it didn't it didn't get me to a, a worrisome life total and this is all just like developed through like reps and just playing lots of games identifying if you're the aggressor or if you just need to sit back and chill you don't need to attack if i had attacked with the with the three two with double strike my wolverine sure i would have gotten six damage in but then i could lose on the on the swing back there's no reason to do that. Unless my opponent plays something crazy and gets themselves back in. But they have to do that. And in limited, it's just not likely that's going to happen. The Ozilus is like an okay card here. It's something. I know I can cycle away my Sanctuary Smasher at some point in the future. And really, because we have Ruinous Ultimatum kind of just hanging out we're just waiting until we get another was it red source and then we're able to play it i guess technically two red sources or another white source before we can play our ultimatum and then it's just gg okay pretty good for my opponent taking out my best creature i guess i'm a little concerned that they're able to cycle so well with that one two blue creature i 
I still feel all right because the most damage my opponent can do is maybe like four damage. Or really like two damage to me each turn. They, they are drawing a lot of cards, so they're, and they're cycling through a lot. It's a little bit concerning. They're gaining more value in that way so they could draw more answers. But I still have kind of like my, my trick up my sleeve. Now, do you cycle this away? I think yes. We're looking for something, you know, unless we happen to draw a red source, then we can play that card. Um, interesting to note here, I, I put the first strike on the 1-3 because the other one already has double strike, but because you can also mutate that Caprador. Passivism is, like, always a nice draw. Just slowing my opponent down before I go to for my Ruinous Ultimatum. I was fine with that, with the fact that they countered away the Passivism. It's, like, not a big deal. This is where Ozolith, which I have mentioned it's not like a great pick, and I'm not sure I would pick it again unless the right circumstances occurred. It's really good in this situation, because if any of my creatures die, I still have it for like future creatures that, that come up. I'm, I'm getting a little bit scared here. My opponent has found a way to come back into this game. They're, they're going pretty wide. So I'm really hoping for that, that next white source. And right here, what I was mentioning with the Mutate, put that on the Stormwild Caprador. That's a really good creature right there. Okay. I decided to just play it as a creature on its own with reach reach doesn't matter i don't know i don't know if that was the right move to maybe i should have put it on my one three i don't know i'm still figuring out the best way to mutate stuff like would it have been better to put it on the one three creature make it into a five four flyer that can't be hit by non-combat damage it would have first strike it's definitely a consideration and then the reason I did this play that you're seeing is so I could have like a wider board in case he has one big swing. I can not die to it immediately. Yeah, opponent should have mutated and gotten back something. I was really happy to see that they just played that, like, outright. Yeah, I was definitely an oops. Here, I was, like, pissed because I didn't draw a red source I'm looking for for, like, all game. If my opponent had gotten back one of the instants and sorceries in their graveyard whether it be removal or just something else like that would have been that would have been bad for me so i mean opponents make mistakes all the time it's just part of the game it's like you will mis make mistakes as well you just have to minimize the amount of mistakes you do and then capitalize on your opponent's mistakes because mistakes always happen in magic even on arena where you have more time to think and you've got more like you can read every card very easily because in paper i think i make more mistakes in paper and and i notice my opponents make way more mistakes when it's just person to person at fnms but due to all this quarantine stuff it sounds like we're not going to be playing like person to person for a while so that's why we got to get used to playing arena online okay opponents doing like tons of stuff definitely worried about this wasn't worried before now i am i haven't hit on anything huge but my opponent's doing like lots of good stuff okay
just trying to find the, the most optimal blocks here. This was good. Well, I don't think it mattered. Yeah, it didn't matter. Okay, still haven't found my red source. That's too bad. I think my opponent takes it from here. Yeah, it's GG if they swing. So I think I give my opponent an opportunity to make the correct decision and just swing out. I can block one. I can kill the other with Blood Curdle. And then right there, the fact that it has Double Strike doesn't, doesn't matter because I'm going to kill it. Opponent gets me down to one. And I've got a long trek back because my I haven't done any damage to my opponent. I don't think I drew particularly well this game. Fortunately, I have to use the Ruinous Ultimatum not on an optimal board state, and opponent has stuff to... Um, I don't have Vigilance. Opponent has stuff to, uh, to play in their hand. Now, this is... I remember this game now. This is interesting because... My opponent has zero cards in hand, so they have to put something out and deal one damage to me. Otherwise, I win. So right here, I don't even play the card out. Opponent goes to draw, they lose. Amazing. Just crazy game. My opponent had all the cards to win. They literally drew all of them, and they couldn't get the win. So I outvalued them with my deck. You just, sometimes you just got to hang on. So that was... That was an insane win condition. I never thought with the deck that I drafted, I'd be decking opponents. But um, they cycle through the cards, and you could see if my opponent hadn't made that one mistake, if they had just mutated the creature, gotten instant sorcery out, they could have had an extra thing of removal, and they could have had that one extra point of damage. So um, I think my opponent lost that game more than I won it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that was crazy. I couldn't believe that that happened. I should make that into like a highlight, that game. I'll consider it. Okay, here I know I... You know, I didn't know if it was good to kill off this creature. I Just the fact that they have flash. Now... This is what I was thinking. I wanted to kill off the card that they have, the companion, the Lutri. They could cast it next turn with the right mana. And I really wanted to get that card. I don't mind paying two damage to see if I can kill off his card. So as soon as I identify that um, my opponent can't play the Lutri, I should consider killing off the 2-2 with my Heartless Act. I don't think I end up doing it. Okay. Alright, I did do it. And opponent has a response. That's a pretty good response. I have plenty of lands, so I don't need to play the Savai Crystal. I can just throw down the Snare Tactician. It can block against the 2-2 unless my opponent does something. And I can cycle away the Savai Crystal later and actually get the cards I need. I don't need extra land. It's a pretty basic move. I think most players would do that, regardless of their skill level. I was happy to see the fact that they captured Sphered by 2-3, because it's not a very impactful creature. 
and they're the the benefit my my opponent got is only two damage if my opponent has a creature they should have played that and developed the board better they shouldn't be using capture sphere at this point now i don't know what my opponent has maybe they, that is the optimal play for them but in general you don't want to waste it on an undeveloped board because all i need is one card to get back in this to develop the board to block off the 2-2 two -two. my plan here is just to cycle away the savai crystal i think Now, I should have considered cycling away, and then with the Snare Tactician, tapping down the opponent's creature. So yeah, that's a mistake on my part. That's just, like, not used to the format, but absolutely I should have done that. Okay, cycle it away, because I don't anticipate me playing that. And as soon as this happened, I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. Whoops. Okay. As a little added benefit, because I have a 4-4 now, I can block everything on the opponent's field, but also I can play the Savai Crystal next turn. Just not even planning on it, but I have the mana set up for it. Like, I can drop the Perimeter Sergeant, then play the Savai Crystal. That was pretty good for my opponent. Well, it was okay, right? Because they had already used Capture Sphere, so that they used a card, so all that was was a one-for-one. One. And they have one card in hand, and they can play the Lutri as soon as they get the mana for it. So I feel fine about my position here. Like, I felt like I could develop. I probably should go with the Perimeter Sergeant into Savai Crystal. Because this is the last turn that I can play it before it gets... Like, either goes back to the graveyard or gets exiled. I know I'm playing a little bit risky. Like, I could save the Blood Curdle and then kill off the, the Cunning Nightbounder. The 3-3. But... I'll just block with the 3-2 against his 3-3. It's really good when you're looking at your opponent and they only have two cards in hand. Because the likelihood that they have a combat trick just is diminished. And they're also playing in such a way that they're just playing whatever comes to the top of their deck. They have to really luck out to get exactly what they need. So you can play a little bit risky. Like, I don't play around counter magic as much um, and if my opponent only has one or two cards unless they're playing like they're saving counter magic okay opponent found something off the top of the deck that's a playable that's sort of scary but the good part is i can kill it with a blitz leech Yeah, this is a this is a cool play because flash my guy in immediate removal it would have block block so it was like a three for one well yeah it was a three for one and i still have a five two on board and removal in my hand feel good about my position here i feel so good that i've I know I can attack. I'm doing five damage, which is quite a lot. Like, put it, my opponent on roughly a four-turn clock, and they are on a seven-turn clock to defeat me. And I have removal in hand. Also, by the very nature, and I've, I'll sort of repeat myself here, I think I have designed a better deck than my opponent. That's not because I'm amazing or anything. It's just that that's the goal, right? Like, you want to design a better deck that outvalues or aggros them down and so i know here that my opponent's the aggressor so 
what's going to be on top of my deck in the next five or six picks when this game keeps going is going to be better and outvalue my opponent. Because we're playing to win. That's kind of a desperation move. I know I had to kill off the creature. I don't want him to do three damage every turn to me. If you guys ever have any questions on anything I'm saying... You can always ask him in the comments and link a timestamp to something I said if it was like controversial or if you don't get it or if you disagree with it. That's the best if you're like, no, Michael, you're wrong. All right, like I can explain myself further or I can hear you out and reassess to see if I'm incorrect. Uh, that's the fun part of like drafting to win. It's, it doesn't matter about my opinion or anyone else's opinion. We're just sharing like the optimal way that we all can get better. And that's the fun part. That's actually why I want like people to watch these videos if they find them helpful um so that we can sort of talk about it and all become better because it's fun to win like magic is just a fun game and then just the one-on-one -on -one competitive aspect of it it's just the best it's just your brain your mindset a limited draft pool versus other players and you choose better picks and and design a better deck a more consistent deck than your opponent it's a lot of fun so right there i had good draws where the game is just swung at this point i had a really good drop and then removal from my opponent so if we're going top of the deck here i feel good about my position they did have a really good draw there because they they found the mana where they can play the card and drop it but i got lucky with the top of my deck as well Okay, pretty good, but not good enough. This is kind of funny interaction. The fact that he killed off my creature, my creature comes back with because of Brood Moth, and I kill off his creature, so that was kind of funny. All right, easy enough. We'll take a break here, and then we'll pick it up in the next game. See you guys. All right, here we go. We are currently at four wins, zero losses, and we're going to the next game. So, kept a land, or kept a handful of lands. It's not great, but it's it's playable. We can work something with this. Start off with the Ozlith, and I think I get some value out of it, out of it with, especially with this hand that I drew a non-human creature, and then I can do the Frill Scale Mentor on that. Give it a a counter. I think it gives it like Mentor or Menace. It gives it a Menace counter. The fact that I drew a removal, I was happy about that. Okay. More removal. Not too bad. Obviously, we don't have a white source. We're looking for it. We do have a three drop. And my three drop beats his two drop right now. But he's probably going for that is it deck that can discard lots of cards and, and draw them. Yep. There we go. That is a deck is pretty powerful. It's not too bad at all. Yes, it puts a menace counter. Okay, the fact that that got essence scattered, it's pretty good for my opponent because they don't know this, but they're really slowing me down. I'm going to have to be trying answers, like drawing... Uh, just creatures to you don't want to let these these types of of is it cycling decks sort of cycle to get to all their big cards of what they want to do you want to be putting pressure on if possible most likely i'm going to be the aggressor in this matchup and they sort of control the board and i'm just unable to do that at this moment fact that I can swing in for 4 damage is a good thing here. But I'm just waiting for my opponent to play something uh, that's going to cause me troubles. It's not looking good for me right now. 
Luckily, I do have a way to remove that. It's just a matter if I use the blood curdle now or if I use the pacifism. I think the correct thing is to just go ahead and use the blood curdle. Yep, get the menace counter on. I wish I would stop drawing lands. But two more swings and we, we could get this. If my opponent plays a creature that can block the 4-2, we've got the pacifism for that. You know, my opponent could be doing this on instant speed. Could use it as a blocker, and they're getting pretty low in life total. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one more turn, and I can play the Void Beckner. I thought it was fine to just go ahead and put the pacifism on the the creature here because I really want to set up for lethal next turn if if possible with the frenzied raptor but most likely my opponent will play some sort of creature here so they can double block and they've been able to cycle through their deck a lot of players uh, short out on creatures with the is it cycling deck but not in this case with the opponent they they were able to find a playable You know, here I might have used Passivism, now that I'm looking at it, too early. I should have maybe saved it for the next drop, because I can get through the the creatures. I think here the Luminous Broodmoth might be a better play. It's definitely a consideration. But, oh, well, not really though, right? Because I can't get through the 4-5 Flyer. Whereas this 8-8 eight, eight with Death Touch definitely can. So I think the correct play is go with the Void Beckner. Ah, oh, mistake. I didn't mind if my opponent double blocks here. Because I get to kill off one of their creatures. And I get the counter with the Ozolith and actually get to put it back on. So I'm getting a lot of value from this pet play. I also get to kill off two creatures. Yeah, that's... Okay. Maybe not a mistake. That was actually a pretty good line of play. Even though I cycle away my big creature, I am I got value out of it. Didn't lose any of my own creatures. I got the death touch counter. Was able to do damage to two of his creatures. It's like a two for one. That's a two for zero, kind of, right? Because I didn't even use a card. And somehow I, I, I got lucky. I That creature does turn into a flying creature. Now he took care of it, but... This set's weird. We're, you know, we're, we're starting out. It's brand new. We're still figuring out how all the cards work, but it definitely feels like a very powerful set. Good part is I can play out both cards in my hand. So if we're worried about counter magic... We play out the probably the Caprador first. Okay, that's a mistake. If my opponent counters this, then I should have started with the Caprador first. It's the weaker creature. We'll give him a target, bait it out. The removal, yep. So for exactly that reason, I should have read this this better. But that's all right. Opponent still could come back from this. Four cards in hand, three cards. I mean, it's possible. They would have to have, play a flyer and then have removal, so maybe not. And they can't use removal to kill off the Caprador. So that seemed like a pretty easy win. I, With the amount of cycling my opponent was doing, I, I don't know what was going on. Surely they should have found some better cards because they didn't really present anything that was too scary. Oh well.
Okay, so five wins, zero losses. At this point, I feel real good. If a run ends at like five wins, it doesn't even matter if I face like insane decks. Um, I'm happy with a five win run. Obviously, the goal is always to get seven, but um, we're, we're kind of playing the long game for value to win the most amount of time. So the fact that I get my money back means that we can do another rep, more practice, get more cards, things like that. Try to see the upside in every opportunity. Okay. I didn't want to throw away this hand, although there was definitely an argument to be made that I should have. Kind of got lucky with the three drop, and I know I have the pacifism. It's sort of good because if your opponent's playing aggressive, you can stop them with the pacifism and sort of draw out more cards. And if the opponent's not playing very aggressive, like playing for value, I'll sort of consider that in the way that I'm playing out my cards. difficult decisions to be made here okay just cycles it away oh shit did anyone else see that just spilled a bunch of coffee on myself <laughs> all right we'll decide that i'll just slide down in our chair perfect problem solved Yeah, these are always fun. The opponent takes a long time. You know, it's not so bad, though, because I, I kind of take... There used to be a famous Hearthstone uh, streamer or, or player. What was his name? He was a professional. And they used to call him, like, something rope because he would always let the rope go all the way down. He would let the rope, and he would just take it to the max amount. So if you had, like, a minute and a half to make each of your turns, he would take it to the rope. Uh, every single time and he got famous for that and it's not because he's annoying or like a, a bad player or anything he just he's me very methodical and he says use the max amount of time and it kind of resonated with me I was like I can I can utilize all the resources yeah people get frustrated people get mad but um, it's, it's within the rules of the game to think about everything and sort of take your time to think about if I play this what's going to happen next what are the cards I'm thinking about countering or possibility of being countered It's not so bad. A lot of it's just patience. Heroes. I was fine with cycling away the Void Beckner. I think most of the time you just cycle away the Void Beckner. It's like just one of those cards that that's cycle stuff away, and it's a maybe for the upside if you're able to play it as a big creature towards the end. Very flexible card. Totally fine if my opponent wants to can't, um, block that. Still feel like I traded a, a bad card, you know, like a three drop, just whatever card for my opponent's field. So I'm happy about that. Okay. I'm like surprised that anyone's playing that. I don't think that's a very good card. It's um it's a five mana artifact 
So colorless mana. It comes in with three counters on it. Uh, this is one of those cards that you just meant to mutate on it. Okay, right now opponent has board control. And that is pretty good. Dealing five damage and drawing a card. Luckily here, I think this is a pretty good situation to Ruminous Ultimatum. I don't have a better play going on. And it's not very good if I wait. I, I feel under pressure a little bit. The added bonus is the artifact, or the um, equipment that my opponent put on, on my Broodmoth went away. So it's kind of a three for one. Well, four for one. It was a four for one, but my opponent drew a card. So almost like a three for one. My opponent has three cards in hand, and one of them could cycle away. Or they could use it at this point. Nope, cycles it away. I was actually happy to see this, because yes, my opponent gets one card back, but it looks like all they're going to do is cycle, so it's not going to have a huge impact on it. And I could pass Fism, the 3-3. Three, three. The, the downside with this play that you're about to see is the ability is still activatable, so he could still mutate that creature and create a 3-3. Three, three. I wanted to make sure that it could not attack because then my opponent would be able to draw a card. And I wanted to swing because if we're racing, I wanted to get a little bit of extra damage in. And I don't mind if my opponent like hits me for three, but if they start to develop, uh, to develop their board further, I'm going to have to keep the Broodmoth back and start blocking. But until my opponent presents something like that, if we're racing, I, I got to keep going because I don't have anything in my hand so i've got to play this play to all my outs and i don't think it's the correct choice just to be passive here now how big is this creature because it might have been i'm going to rewind just a little bit so that's a three four so just think about this guys um putting a three four creature mutate onto this creature yeah it's good it has upside it makes a 3-3, three, three, but this creature deals X damage to any target. X is the number of times this creature is mutated. The upside here is that he's mutating this creature, which creates a 3-3, three, three, okay, which deals damage to my face. Uh, I think it's three times, one, two, three times. But the problem is then you just, you're throwing away these 3-4 stats onto this creature. In my opinion, it would have been way better just to play this card out. And for future mutate cards, that's when you get the benefit of this. I don't think it's worth it to do what my opponent did. That's just my opinion. Okay, creates a 3-3. Three, three. If it taps down... Oh, you know what? That is a recurring ability. I, I didn't consider that. So they can do this every turn. You know, in that case, th that was a good move. Right? Because at the end of the turn, they could tap it down, deal damage to my face, and just keep that going. So they're turning the creature that was has pacifism on it into a good creature. I was happy to see the Cloud Piercer because that blocks one of the 3-3s. Three I think at this point I have to play defense. I don't think I can swing. Let's see what my opponent chooses to do. Deals three damage to my face. So right now, on the face of it, on the board, they're um, they're they're gonna win unless I remove that creature even further. So I take all that back. It was it. I'm providing the good analysis, but it in this case it actually was warranted. And here, this this pretty much seals the game. Yep. 
All right, good good decisions for my opponent. We lost that one. Starting with the next game. I believe I'm five at one at this point. Five wins, one loss. It's a good hand to keep. I've got a three drop, three drop. As soon as I find my black source, that enables the the really good Heartless Act is a really good card. I think you're going to see that a lot in Constructed, and it's one of the best sets of removal, uh, pieces of removal in this set. Okay, probably time to drop down the Snare Tactician. You don't want to play the Perimeter Sergeant. It's got, it's got two health. Although I did consider the fact that when Perimeter Sergeant attacks, it gives it would give Snare Tactician plus one. So... But we'll go with the obviously correct choice. Okay. Opponent has removal. And that's a good piece of removal because it lets you fix fix your deck a little bit. Fix your hand. Here, do you just throw down the Broodmoth? I think so, but I also was concerned that my opponent would have more removal. And if I play a little bit safer and just throw out the, the worst card, if my opponent removes it, I don't mind doing that, and it still doesn't lose anything on board. That's kind of why I went with that play. I really don't want to lose the Broodmoth to just easy removal. And if my opponent has it, like... They just, they just have a higher likelihood of having it. They're not playing creatures. They're holding mana up. Um, it seems like the behavior of someone who has like removal in their hand. And just their colors, too. Same as me. Okay, playing the, the Saval Crystal into Perimeter Sergeant is a consideration but maybe brood moth would be the best move here i think just throwing down the brood moth is probably the correct choice uh, it's fine developing the board it's it wasn't worth it to do one attack there because in the colors and the current board state that my opponent has like they're probably, they could zerg me down, and I have slightly less life than my opponent, so there's no reason to swing with my 1-3. Okay, slam down the Brood Moth, and I can play the stuff in my hand if I need to. Actually, it is kind of good, because I could definitely swing with the Sergeant. And because my board is better, and I have two pieces of removal in my hand... I, I feel like I definitely have board control. Even if my opponent swings back, I can I can do something with that. I can block with the brood moth, and if they want to do something cute like a po combat trick, I'll just remove the creature. Okay. Nothing I can do about that. You know, I did mess up here. I actually was realizing I messed up. So what I should have done is played Heartless Act on the stack. So we're backing up a little bit. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on, on Ceratops, Pyroceratops. That's the point when you should, should use Heartless Act and kill that creature. Now that he has a counter on it, I can't remove it with Heartless Act. That's a mistake. That's just a brand new format. Hope to not make that mistake again. And I was realizing it at this point.
it actually might be a huge mistake. Like, opponent may get ahead from this point just because of that. Checking to see what the CMC is. You just... I think what you do is just let it mutate, then take care of it. Looks like Heartless Act onto the 3-4. I don't think, well, yeah. I think why I went with that decision is because Heartless Act is just a more, more of a flexible card. So I wanted to use Easy Prey because it's three damage coming through anyway. And so if I used Heartless Prey or Heartless Act on this creature, that would have been fine. But while I have the opportunity, just kill it and it they would deal the same amount of damage. Now, why I chose to attack there looks a little weird, but I'm trying to play to every out that I that I possibly can. And defending is not going to do me any good here because I can't block anything from my opponent. So uh, it they're going to get six damage in anyway. So I might as well try to race with them. And if I can remove something on their board, if I keep drawing removal or a bigger creature, then I can win the race later on. I also think it's a weak move if I had stayed back, not attacked, and I've had my two creatures block the uh, this card, the 3-4. I think that would have been a, a weak play. Okay, it's a good thing I drew the Blood Curdle. Here, I think the move is to swing out and then save the blood curdle for opponent's turn. It's totally fine to see that. If opponent wants to use a combat trick, then I'll use my removal. But they didn't do that. It made no sense to me. They must have some sort of follow-up. No? Alright, they just gave me a card. They have enough life total, so it, it, it doesn't make sense. Might have been a mistake or something. I was fine with putting lifelink on that creature i'm probably going to remove it i might have removed it anyway but that just makes the choice pretty easy okay able to put a menace counter on my three two that's really really good in this situation there's no need to play the Ruinous Ultimatum. Wait till I can get further value from that card. Because my opponent can't block anything, so they're forced to play something or remove my card. Either way, it's a tempo swing back to me. Because my opponent uses the next card that they draw to remove my 3-2. It's still alright for me, but if they do this instead and they play a creature, now I can 2-for-1 them. That's that's the the benefit of having a, a really good like ruinous ultimatum and then just playing, designing your deck to have value so that it could um, it can deliver, like having good cards in the field and that's that's where you get like advantages over your opponent. Drawing the cloud piercer is really important. Cause it's, cause it's something. 
and it, it's a pretty good creature too. Okay, two for one, board's clear, and we can win next turn. Opponent has to play something, and then whatever they play, probably my Cloud Pierce is going to be bigger. I also can mutate it onto the Stormwild Caprador and go for lethal. So if that creature doesn't have reach, and it, it doesn't, and my opponent can't, they can't really remove the Stormwild Caprador just based on the, the text of that card, then I should have the win here. Also, as an added benefit, the Perimeter Sergeant has a menace on it, so. We're just getting benefits everywhere. Get to cycle away the swamp. And there we go. GG. Okay, so six wins. And then from here on out, unfortunately, I just lose the, the last two games. Let's let's watch them. If you guys are like bored or whatever, you've already clicked away from the video. So um kind of that's concluding all the, the wins that you're gonna see. This this run is gonna be a loss into a loss. But um just trying to provide as much value as possible to anybody watching this. Like, let's go through and let's analyze our plays and the opponent's plays and see if we could have done anything better. Yeah, you keep this hand. It's quite good. It's actually a really good hand. And I don't remember how I lost these games. I played them a couple days ago. This this video's taken me like, kind of filmed it over like three or four days, like four days. Just had a lot of stuff going on. Okay, here I, it's funny I can like you guys can't see it but I can watch myself like on stream I'm like talking to chat and I'm like um, I get a couple viewers that uh, mostly they're just friends and stuff and kind of talk to them and stuff so sorry for the delay so here I actually think that it, there's there's not really a good reason to play the Ozolith but there is a good reason to not play to cycle away the Saval Crystal and get something better or to cycle away the Easy Prey if it's unusable. So like here, I don't even think I would use Easy Prey on that target. And the Ozolith doesn't get gain me any, any value. Like yes, it might get it later, but um, all the more reason why I'm not sure if I would draft that card again unless it's there's a super compelling reason. Just kind of a, a a rare benefit of Saval Crystals. It helps you ramp up. So next turn I could play a five drop. I could play the Cloud Piercer. And I believe I drew a better five drop. The rooting Moloch. reason i think it's better because even though it's a 4-4 i could put the cloud pierce on top of that like mutate it i don't have a cycling card in the graveyard so maybe it would have been worth like using the easy prey like Playing the Cloud Piercer later, use the Easy Prey, and then after that, play the Rooting Moloch so that I could use the Easy Prey again at a later time. That would have been the maximum value play. Okay, kind of weird that my opponent chose to attack with the 3 4, and that's the obvious blocker. 
So let's see what they're going to do about that. Yeah, okay. Divine Arrow. Okay, do you play the Rumbling Rock Side and remove something from my opponent's board? The benefit there is that my opponent, I, I have more cards than my opponent, so if I could slow them down from what they're doing, uh, I, I, I will use the cards in my hand to outvalue them over the long run. And I've got three pieces of, four pieces of removal in my hand. So I don't have to play a creature here. Because if I play a creature, it could enable, if they're holding up their final piece of removal, uh, then they just, they get all that extra damage in. So it's just a consideration. For whatever reason, I decided to go for the creature there. Although looking at it now, I might have done the Rumbling Rock Slide while the opponent was tapped out. And they have no way to stop it on the 3-4. And I definitely have to prioritize killing that creature. I have to block here. I don't think I can let all this damage through. And if it comes back as a flyer, it's not a big deal because I have reach. Oh, this is a mistake. Watch this. So I didn't know that this is the way this works. You have a mutated creature. It dies. Both creatures come back. That's real bad with the brood moth. In that case, you you should always, in that, if they are swinging and they have a brood moth, and they're swinging with a mutated creature, block the other creature. I should have blocked the marshal here. Would have killed it off. Yes, I would have gotten it back, and it would have triggered this, but... Um, yeah, I just I just didn't know. So opponent got a lot of value from, from that play. And they just use a removal and pretty much finish off the game. So my opponent zerged me down before I could play out all the cards in my hand. The cards in my hand are better, and if I had enough life total to work with, this would be better for me, but it just isn't working out that way. And with the Essence Scatter, yeah, this game's totally over. With the Passivism, they swing for the win. So, good enough. All right, final game. I kept that hand, which was... Uh, yeah, we'll see if it hurts me, but probably should have just mulligan this hand away. I was thinking if I drew any land at all, I could cycle the Easy Prey or the Saval Crystal away and get myself, like, fixed. Like, fix the hand. It's not the worst hand to keep. And you really don't want to go down a card versus... Someone with presumably a really good deck. But you also don't want to get screwed like I am. It's it's a hard choice to make. Okay, opponent's able to cycle away a big card. Hits their land drop. And are they going to play anything? What I don't want to see is a two drop with two power on it. I'm not sure if there's any two drops with three power. There might be. I don't know about this set. Very lucky I found a land here. We'll give it a pass. I'm hoping that my opponent plays... A two drop creature, but they are they're not going to unless they draw one. Because otherwise they they would have played it. So most likely what we do here is cycle away the easy prey. Because if I draw on land, I'm considering playing the Saval Crystal so I can get things going. The reason I want my opponent to play a 2-drop is so I can get value from the Easy Prey as opposed to cycling it away. Although the benefit of me cycling it away is I could find that next land that I really need. Okay. 
So here the move is to cycle away the Saval Crystal. Or maybe the Easy Prey. I, I don't know. Most likely this is going to die based on something in my opponent's hand unless they choose to develop the board. Could put a four drop. If they swing, I'll probably block. Force him to use a card. Okay. Yeah, and I think you just definitely take the block here. If they want to use a card to win this trade, I'm I'm okay with that. I was, I was lucky to draw something. I'm not under a lot of pressure, so it wouldn't be the worst if my opponent just swing in, uh, swing in with the 2-3. While well, I'm still, you know, trying to, to fix my, my mana. This is a downside of having, like, Ruminous Ultimatum, is that you can't, if you draw it early on like this, does you no good it's just a dead card in hand but i still think the upside is worth it a lot of these those types of cards are worth building around if you get them early Okay. That's not a card I see a lot of people playing. I don't think it's that great of a card. Just three mana, one one that helps you find a basic land. It is good as a target that you can throw a mutate creature on, but it's still not worth three mana for a one one, in my opinion. It doesn't do anything. Like yes, it finds you a land, but and it's a it's a creature. But you'd rather have a a three four or a three two or a four two. Like you can get all those stats on a totally blank creature um, with no text or anything on it, just for the stats alone. Like you're paying for a card that has is a one one. Like yes, you can mutate. This is this is a good thing, but. You can mutate without the three drops. Just so happens that my opponent had a good card to build around. And I think they actually draw another one here as this game goes on. I feel like I got to double block this. And he can go ahead and take one of my cards. Okay, for some reason I let that through. It's got vig vigilance on it, so yeah, I don't know about that. Can't attack. There's not any good attacks. It's not worth swinging over the top for one damage. And the fact that I didn't block the 3-3 with Vigilance last turn, if I'm going to do the same move this turn, that means it was a mistake last turn, right?
okay. Opponent's just going on the aggressive game plan, which I, I think is pretty good when you have the creatures that he has. Isn't this an hilarious username? Free C. Alice. <laughs> I don't want to trade off my 1-3 creature, obviously. I've got enough life total where the 3 damage is not worth a card. A free card for my opponent. I'm happy to do those trades. I'm the one stumbling on mana, and they have lots of mana open and three cards in hand, so I'm just hoping that the longer this game goes on, I can win it through having a ruinous ultimatum, getting like a two for one or three for one. I I think I mutated onto that card because it, it has flying, and it you can't kill it with the text from the the one three flyer. I probably should have discarded Easy Prey, huh? Kept the Void Vector. These are like micro mistakes that you're not sure if they're correct at the time. You know that as I said, it can't be removed. It's like, that's the one card that can definitely remove it. Like the exile. Okay, it's just pretty good that my opponent was able to find the 3-3 with Vigilance. And I can't even play my Sanctuary Smasher. It's not a good move to cycle that thing away. Here I learned that Ozolith, you can target opponent's creatures. So I was thinking in my head immediately, I was like, oh, there's got to be some sort of deck that could use minus one, minus one counters that when they're on your creatures, they benefit you. And then you could put, like, when your creatures die, they go on the Ozolith. And then beginning of combat, you could put negative one, negative one counters on their creatures. There might be a deck in Historic or whatever. That, that benefits I was happy to play this out because then it puts me on board control opponent did not have an instant speed way to remove my creature these are just things I pick up like you know just I think most players do this like innately, but it's kind of good to remember that play play with the information your opponent's giving you, and if they draw the answer, it's okay to not play around that. You shouldn't play around maybes. You should play around what you know to the best of your ability, because in limited, most of the time that's you're going to be right. And so playing that way is going to get you the highest percent chance you're going to be wrong like all the time you're going to be wrong if you're wrong 20 percent of the time that feels like every time but um like i'm going to play like my opponent does not have removal okay okay and you're going to be right you're going to be right you're going to be right and then they're going to draw it and then they get you and it's like well i still made the decision that i made and i'm still like sticking with that line of play and i'm going to attack in such a way that they don't have removal if you've if it looks like they've identified now a good opponent will mind game you and play in such a way that it looks like they don't have removal and then use it at the last second when it looks really good to do so so these are i don't know if that's a good lesson or not but that's that's stuff i've picked up and it it gets me wins that i really don't have any business getting otherwise and so i i think it's helpful enough to like put it on like the record and put it on a youtube video like this if, if anyone out there finds that interesting it just um, is another way to think about the game i was happy to get value to the snare, snare tactician in some way um before it dies
and here if I draw a white source and a white source I win the game because I just use ruinous ultimatum and probably get so far ahead and swing four times with the sanctuary smasher but I don't think I found my planes and therefore ruinous ultimatum just stays a dead card also my opponent drew like an amazing creature it's like probably one of the best cards in their deck. Removes my creature, gets them board control. Look at this swing. Yeah. And I don't have great targets for my Divine Arrow. On most boards, I'd be able to kill off a, a medium-sized creature, but I was only able to take the smallest creature, and opponent wins the game. So, yep, that's how it goes. We, we had an out. If we drew correct mana, we would have been all right. And so, yeah, that was a, that was a good run, and I was I was – um i was proud of that it's kind of i was playing this on the second day the the icoria came out and had a good run and i thought i would record it and share it with you guys and i have fun doing this and um if you guys ever have any questions or anything or just want to contact me like directly like you guys definitely do it through the comments through hitting me up uh send me a message um you guys can send me like an email. It's michaelcoolman7 at gmail.com. Sure, like anything. Like M-I-C-H-A-E-L-K-U-H-L-M-A-N, the number seven, at gmail.com. So I'm always up to interact with – I want to see if like – I think I get like five or six views on the last videos, last video that I had for drafting to win. And I'm curious, like, if you guys want to hang out and just, like, talk about this or um, anything at all, I'll promote your channel, whatever it is. But, uh, yeah, thank you for watching, and uh, I hope you guys appreciate this content. Let me know if it's too long or too boring or you guys hated it or um, the analysis wasn't good or if you disagree with something like that or if you thought it was awesome um, and helpful because that's really the, the point of doing all these. So I appreciate you guys sticking through till the end, and – Stay tuned for the next episode because these things aren't going away. So, all right. See you guys.